Oh, you're dining in Paris with a full belly of French onion soup and a mouthful of double chocolate souffle. <laughs> okay, enough of that bad accent. The waiter approaches asking how your meal was, and mouth full, you give a satisfied expression and make the A-OK gesture. You expect to see happiness on the waiter's face, but he looks at you with irritation. Well, it turns out that making a circle with your index finger and thumb does not mean OK in certain countries. In France, it means zero or worthless. Instead of praising the delicious food, you called it worthless. Oops. In Venezuela, Turkey, and Brazil, it's a hand gesture you shouldn't use either. In these countries, this is a sign that will offend pretty much anyone you flash it at. Enough said. Just give them your biggest smile and wait till you finish what's in your mouth to give your proper thanks. All over the world, giving a thumbs up is seen as a positive thing. It's an expression of your liking towards something that everything is good. In parts of Italy, West Africa, Iran, and Greece, though, it carries a stigma as an incredibly offensive gesture. When visiting Malaysia, you use this digit to point at things. So next time you're trying to hitchhike in these countries, you should reconsider sticking your thumb out for a ride. You might never get picked up. Trying to order two of anything or showing someone the peace sign in the UK, Australia, or New Zealand is fine, as long as you don't have your hand the wrong way. Do this gesture wrong, and you're giving a very offensive hand signal, which isn't going to win you many friends. So make sure that when you have your index and middle fingers pointed up in the V-shape, your palm is facing outwards, and you'll have a great time, mate! Bowing is used a lot in East Asian cultures to greet each other and guests. The deeper the bow is, the more respect you are being given. Fortunately, most Japanese don't expect foreigners to understand the bowing etiquette right away. They'll generally also accept a handshake or a nod. But being familiar and practicing your bowing etiquette before going to Japan will impress all the locals. How low can you go? Using your index fingers is considered impolite in several European, Latin American, and African nations. It's particularly rude in China, Japan, and Indonesia when pointing at a person. The gesture might be taken as you singling someone out to blame or insult them. If you ask for directions in the Philippines, you might be left scratching your head, wondering where they're pointing. Don't be alarmed. The locals use their lips instead of raising their hands. When in doubt, wherever you are in the world, just gesture toward a person or place using your entire hand. You might think that sticking your pinky finger out makes you look fancy. But in China, it's frowned upon. This gesture is the same as giving a thumbs down and meaning that something is making you unhappy. When taking photos with others, you want to be respectful and don't want to make any obscene hand gestures. Two gestures to avoid, in particular, are sticking up only your pinky finger and pointing at something with a dirty object, like a used fork or a chopstick. Now, it's fun to eat with chopsticks, but you might accidentally cause offense if you put them down the wrong way. When you're in China, South Korea, or Japan, don't make the mistake of sticking your chopsticks upright in a bowl of rice. This is considered bad luck. Oops. If you have to put your chopsticks down, simply place them on the side or across the bowl instead. Likewise, when eating in South Korea or China, don't ask someone to pass you some food. In these countries, you have to join in the action and grab what food you desire. And you're not going to offend anyone if you take that last bite either. In some places, it's acceptable to blow your nose while at the dinner table. Not all of us are even prepared for the sudden trickle of the nose. But as long as you excuse yourself and turn away, everything is okay. Except if you're vacationing in Japan, China, or South Korea, where the chilies can make your nose runny very quickly. So never blow your nose in public. If you must clear your nostrils, consider leaving the table and blowing your nose in the restroom or hiding away from any other observers while being quiet. It's considered rude and unhygienic to the people around you. Always use a paper tissue, not a handkerchief, and throw it away after use. Fiji is one of the top destinations in the world. Beautiful beaches and friendly people. 
spending your vacation on this island, you're bound to meet a few local Fijians that'll want to shake your hand for a very long time. It's customary to hold your hand for the entire time that you're exchanging greetings, no matter how long. You should also make sure not to pull away too quickly. It's considered very rude if you end the handshake abruptly. If you are in India, you put your hands together instead of shaking a person's hand. Holding your hands in a prayer formation, tilt your head down slightly and greet the person with namaste with your hands close to your chest. Crossing your arms means nothing in most countries. Maybe you're cold, bored, or it just feels more comfortable. In Finland, though, it's likely to send the wrong kind of message. Having your arms crossed means major disrespect. Finnish people see this as a sign of arrogance and defiance. It's done mainly to tell the people around you that you're looking for trouble. Yikes! This body language will be taken as a dare, so you're likely to be confronted if you do it. Specifically, avoid crossing your arms at people directly. You don't want to cause any trouble if you're over there on holiday. It might be tempting to shake hands with a person as soon as you meet them in Russia. But if it's in a doorway, forget about it! It's not the end of the world if you forget this simple rule. But some Russian people consider it to be very unlucky. Step all the way through the doorway before you extend your hand for a handshake. This goes for restaurants, homes, shops, and just about anywhere else you can think of with a doorway. Avoid this simple mistake and you'll save yourself some trouble and bad luck. The head is the most sacred part of the body in Thailand, so patting anyone on the head can be seen as a serious offense. In the United States, patting or ruffling someone's hair is meant to be playful or even an indication that someone's done a good job. But in Thailand, it's best to keep your hands away from other people's heads to avoid disrespecting or making them feel unclean. It's also wise to not point with your toes as feet are considered the dirtiest part of the body. While on holiday, the last thing you want to be doing is insulting people. Looking at your watch in the middle of a conversation can be considered extremely rude in the Middle East. It looks like you're in a hurry to get away from the person you're talking to. Even if you've got an appointment for something, you don't want to be rude. Let the conversation run its natural course before checking the time. In Arabic culture, once communication has started, it must take its time. (laughs) Get it? Don't ever use the palm out, fingers up, stop gesture in Greece. You might not like the outcome if you do this to a local. This gesture is a huge insult to Greeks, a stigma that dates back to the Byzantine times. Likewise, in South Korea, don't hail a cab or wave someone over to you with your palm facing up. If you do, you might be stuck there for hours. Waving your hand like that is how Koreans summon their dogs. The proper way to wave is to stick your arm out while having your palm facing down and moving your head up and down vertically. This isn't the only thing to keep in mind in South Korea. If someone older than you offers a drink, The proper etiquette is to receive it with both hands and then turn your head away as you take the first sip. It's a show of respect, and respecting one's elders is taken very seriously in South Korea. Let me continue my world tour, and now we're heading straight to Europe. Let's start our journey in Greece, a place with thousands of years of history. Even in modern days, there are still ancient ruins there that are being carefully preserved, and it's an interesting ride. The airport of Athens has a built-in museum with ancient artifacts. And here's how ancient and modern coexist there. Here's the view of the Acropolis from the street. A Spartan roaming the streets of Greece. A Redditor shared a photo of a modern building built right over the ancient ruins. The visitors can see the ruins through the glass. Greece is also very well known for its cats roaming the streets everywhere. This Redditor spotted a cat guarding the National Bank of Greece. These days, everyone is trying to reduce the usage of plastic. Some use paper straws and some go with glass straws. But this cafe in Greece offered to use macaroni as straws. I'm not sure if it's stupid or genius. Another user went to a restaurant in North Macedonia and got baffled when they served slices of pizza on waffles. Double win, a snack and no waste. In Romania, vending machines seem to be a thing. 
This one, for example, is a machine with ham. And here's a better one, a vending machine selling cartons of eggs. Scrambled eggs, probably. Europe is a place where old neighbors are modern, and this combination is mesmerizing. I'll show you. This Redditor shared a photo of a modern basketball court squeezed between 700-year-old walls in Croatia. And here's a photo from inside a grocery store. Look at these old columns. Modern problems require modern solutions. These traffic lights light up the ground so that people who store their phones could notice when the light changes. Italy is a work of art with thousands of years of history. I have quite a bunch of stuff for you from there. Some ruins date back thousands of years, and a lot of that gets preserved. A Redditor shared a photo of a lobby of a hotel that has a glass floor so that the ruins were visible. And these are the railing in an Airbnb. Even street signs are a work of art in Italy. Look at this one. Another Redditor shared even more designs. This Redditor showed a photo of a supermarket that is located in an old theater in Venice. Another user added one more photo of that supermarket. Since we're talking about supermarkets, apparently, pets are allowed there. There are even special carts to carry them. Cities are centuries old, and there are quite a few narrow streets, so post vehicles have to adjust to fit them. Here's one of them. Some cities have canals or are located on islands, so boats are a thing. This is a UPS boat at Murano Island. Europe is packed with countries. The city of Basel in Switzerland is located right on the border with France and Germany. So the airport has three exits. You can walk out of it to France, Germany, or Switzerland. Let's walk out in Germany. Look, there's a traffic light with a girl walking a camel. The reasons are a mystery to me because camels aren't really a German thing, but it's cute. Here's another unique street light featuring Karl Marx, a famous German philosopher. Back to baffling vending machines. In Germany, you can find vending machines with sausages. Hamburg is Germany's major port city. There's a river that connects it to the North Sea. No wonder there's a drive through McDonald's for a boat. Look at this design of mineral water that is being sold in the Swiss Alps. A Redditor brought a souvenir from France. These are baguette-shaped pens. Look at this narrow house in Spain. I wonder what it looks like inside, but unfortunately, the Redditor only shared the exterior. In Portugal, cell phone towers are disguised as trees. And this is a bus that can ride the roads and then turn into a boat. A Redditor spotted doors in London that have doorknobs in the center. This seems super inconvenient, but apparently the handle doesn't turn and exists only to pull the door closed. And the metal part with the keyhole has a little handle on the bottom of it. Europe is a historical place. This post box bears the mark of a king ruling over a century ago. Back in the day, red telephone boxes were in high demand. Nowadays, when every person has a cell phone or two, not so much. So telephone boxes are being used in different ways. This one, for example, is now a smartphone repair shop. Luxembourg is a small but rich country squeezed between France, Germany, and Belgium and they have baguette vending machines. Let's move north first to the Netherlands. Farmers border their fields with a strip of flowers and put up a sign with a QR code where people can pay for picking the flowers. And here's just a weird installation spotted by some Redditor. In Denmark, in Aarhus, a city founded by the Vikings in the 8th century, you can find traffic lights with Vikings pictured on them. Some trash cans in Swedish subways have a separate space for cans. Homeless people can pick them up and exchange the cans for some cash. There's a giant statue of a silver moose in Norway. And these are signs on bathroom stalls depicting reindeer. Apparently, Finnish people are as polite as Canadians. On the bus, they have a button to thank the bus driver. Also, a Redditor spotted a raccoon pattern on a bus seat. We all know rocking horses. Most of you probably had one in your early days. Well, Finnish little people have rocking moose. 
Many people come to Iceland hoping to see the Northern Lights. A Redditor had a phone in the hotel which had a special button to wake the guest up when the Northern Lights appear. Lithuanians sometimes put fake police cars on the sides of the road to combat road speeding. Europe has been ruled by kings and queens for centuries. Even today, many countries like the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and some other countries have monarchs. So, no wonder that there are hundreds of castles scattered across Europe. Poland doesn't have any monarchs these days, but it still has 500 castles. Here's a warning sign for ghosts next to one of them. In Wrocław, all landmarks have a model so that visually impaired people could touch and see them too. There's also a statue of Darth Vader in one Polish city. In reality, it's a statue of a Polish magnate who supervised the construction of a port. But from time to time, locals dress the statue in Lord Vader's costume. This sign in Poland specifically prohibits bikes, tractors, and horses to go on a highway. In some places, there's a separate line on the sidewalk for people who are walking and staring at their phones. And now, we travel across the Atlantic to Africa. This is Dune 7 in Namibia, the seventh biggest dune in the world. It's as tall as the Empire State Building. An internet user shared this photo. Someone in Tanzania put a literal penthouse on top of the building. I did some research and found out that it's a hotel. Still doesn't explain the roof, but I'm totally buying it. Maybe it's marketing. Drivers in Mozambique should be careful and watch out for elephants. And this is a sign from South Africa. Watch out for penguins. And another one that asks to baboon-proof the trash bins. So baboons are the raccoons of South Africa. Trees growing through the roads aren't surprising anymore, but this is a palm tree in Morocco growing through multiple balconies. A Redditor shared a photo of a runaway horse in Israel returning to the backyard in an urban area. Urban horse encounters are relatively common in the country. A hotel in Turkey served a whole honeycomb for breakfast to this Redditor. It's your first trip to Egypt, and your new friends there invited you for lunch. The food seems a bit dull, so you decide to spice it up with salt and pepper. You don't see it on the table, so you ask the host for it, and you notice everyone's shocked. It turns out it's a huge insult to the cook when someone wants to change the original taste of the food on their plate. The cook made it that way for a reason, and wanting to spice it up means showing that the dish wasn't good enough. You're used to doing it as a kind gesture around the world, but don't tip waiters, taxi drivers, or hotel workers in Japan. They can get offended because they already get paid for providing you with good service, and there's no need for extra money to make it any better. If you really want to show appreciation, just say thank you. It's okay to tip private guides, tour companies, and interpreters. You can put any amount that feels right to you in an envelope and hand it down to them. If you want to impress your new Japanese friends or colleagues, take some time to study chopstick etiquette. When you master the art of holding chopsticks, remember not to rub them together. People do it to remove splinters, so it might look like you're unhappy with the quality of the pair that your host provided you with. Don't put your chopsticks vertically in your bowl of rice. This way, it can be seen as an offering to the deceased. Don't wave chopsticks in the air or use them to point at things. Both are considered really rude. The same is with moving things with your chopsticks or the hand holding them. It looks disrespectful. Plus, you're likely to spill things. When in Italy, don't order a cappuccino afternoon. The locals don't do it because they believe the milk and foam turn this drink into a meal and it's not good for digestion. Also, be prepared to enjoy your coffee standing at the bar and pay for it before you even order it. First, you pay the cash register, then show the receipt to the server to get your drink. Are you a big fan of chewing gum? Well, you'll have an uneasy time in Singapore. Using, selling, and importing chewing gum is banned there, and you'd have to pay up to several thousands of dollars for doing it. 
This law was introduced in the 1990s to make the city cleaner and keep the local fast trains up to schedule. When they launched a new transit system, passengers stuck gum onto train door sensors, causing some serious delays. With the new rules, this problem was solved. The no gum policy, along with many other strict rules, did help to make Singapore a really clean and fine city. Pun intended. If you absolutely can't imagine your life without chewing, the local authorities recommend replacing the gum with bananas. When someone asks you to pass them something, like salt at the table in Bolivia, don't give it directly to them. Hand it to the person sitting next to them and they'll pass it for you. If the person next to you is asking for that little favor, you still can't hand it straight to them. The person next to you will have to help. This table etiquette comes from a superstition that handing something to someone directly into their hands brings bad luck. For the same reasons, you can't reach across the table or stand up to pass something or toss it to someone. And don't forget to keep both hands on the table when you aren't eating. It might look like you're trying to hide something if your hands aren't visible at all times. When you arrive for a meal in Jordan, the hosts may give you some bitter Arabic coffee as a warm welcome. Don't try to stretch it for the rest of the evening. The polite thing to do is empty it fast. Only when everyone's done with the drink do people go back to socializing. As you pass the empty cup to the hosts, make sure to jiggle your wrists. If you just pass it without jiggling, it will mean you're asking for a refill. Don't rush to arrive at an event on time in Venezuela. People might think that you're rude or greedy. The polite thing to do is to be 10 to 15 minutes late. Events scheduled for 7 o'clock will often begin at 8 o'clock or later. A popular story goes that in the 1980s, a foreign reporter arrived at a press event more than an hour late. When he saw the room was mostly empty, he went to apologize to the host for missing the event. The host then told him he was the first reporter to arrive. It's quite interesting because the clocks in this country have officially been 0.9 seconds ahead of the rest of the world for years. Are you planning to travel by bus in Ireland anytime soon? Don't forget to thank the driver for the ride on your way out of the bus. You'll hear an overwhelming majority of locals do it loudly as it's basically not optional. Choose the gift wisely if you've been invited to a home in Vietnam. It's okay to bring fruit, sweets, or incense. Handkerchiefs are believed to be a symbol of a sad farewell, and cutting tools are a sign of cutting relationships, so don't bring those. Wrap your gift in colorful paper and don't opt for black. The locals believe this color to be a bad omen. When you present the gift, hold it with both hands. And don't be surprised if the hosts don't open it right away. It's done after the giver has left. Don't leave anything on your plate in India. It's a sign of disrespect for the food you were served. Food is considered sacred in the country, so it would upset your hosts a lot. So wash and dry your hands before starting the meal. Don't forget to praise the cook and wait for the eldest to stand up before you leave the table. In South India, it's common to serve food on a banana leaf. You gotta fold it over from the top when you're done with the meal. Folding it from the bottom means you weren't satisfied with what you got. It might be a good conversation starter elsewhere, but don't brag about your achievements in Denmark. The locals believe that everyone is equal, so you won't hear them talk about their successful careers or talents or how special they are and they expect the same from you. If you're looking for a good topic, they'll gladly talk to you about the greatness of their country. The Danes are really proud of it and all its wonders. If you're going on a trip to Germany and plan to drive on the famous Autobahn, make sure to tank up before you hit the road. Stopping, parking, making U-turns, and backing up on this super speedy highway is illegal. Yes, even if you have to stop because you've run out of gas, you'll have to pay a fine since you were supposed to plan things better. And although the Autobahn technically doesn't have a speed limit, watch out if you're passing by urban areas like Frankfurt, Berlin, and Munich, or construction works and heavy traffic. There will be special speed instructions for these spots. In case you're planning to explore Cyprus by car, 
Quench your thirst before you start the vehicle. Drinking anything, including water, isn't allowed while driving on the island. So if you can't resist snacking or drinking behind the wheel, prepare to pay a fine. In Ethiopia, you gotta think twice before choosing a gift for someone. They see it as a debt they'll have to repay in the future. So if you bring something really expensive, the receiver will either have to spend a lot of money on a return gift or feel indebted to you. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors. Phew. The airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks. Or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. Always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears. For example, by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles. It's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. 
The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence, and while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilots for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and therefore aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners. They won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one. Don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movies. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well. Hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations, or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects, like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection because all cameras come with lenses. 
Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally, though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around. See if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains, and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side. First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. 
You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins, and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. If you're going on vacation, I'm sure you forgot to pack a couple of useful items, like a crayon or a pillowcase. I have collected the best travel tips for your ultimate vacation. You should carefully think about when you are planning to go somewhere. In case you have some kind of flexibility, just forget about going on a trip in July. You don't need to travel during the busy season. It's too expensive and there are way too many people. The best time to travel is during the shoulder season, which is between the high and low seasons. In Greece, for example, it's April and May in September, October. The weather is already or still great, but there are fewer people and the accommodation is way cheaper. When searching for flights, always do it in incognito mode. If you do it in the regular mode, the saved cookie files will track your searches and cheaper flights will be less likely to pop up since you've been searching for a while. Don't give yourself away. Always go incognito. Another trick is to pick a different home country and currency, the one with a better exchange rate. This way you can buy tickets in different currencies that will be way cheaper. Next, when buying the ticket, make a flyer account, no matter the airline you travel with. Airlines gift you miles, and when enough, you can get a free flight. Even if you travel with different airlines, there is no need to miss out on an opportunity. And yes, don't dispose of your plane ticket after the trip until you saw that your miles were posted on your flyer account. Also, if you ever need to cancel a non-refundable ticket, just don't cancel it and don't show up. In case something happens and the flight gets canceled, you will get your money back because no one knew you weren't going to fly anyways. As for picking the seats, if you fly with someone, don't pick the seats next to each other. Keep the middle seat between you and there will be a higher probability that it won't be booked unless the plane is full. If you're lucky, you'll have three seats for the two of you. But if you end up getting a neighbor, you can just ask them to switch seats with you so that one of you can sit next to each other with whoever you're traveling with. Most people will be happy to switch. If you have a long layover, use it to your advantage. Six hours layovers aren't cool. Too long to chill in the airport but too short to get out. In this case, better opt for longer layovers and use them to explore the city before your next flight. If you're booking a hotel, always join their loyalty program. Just like with plane tickets, it won't hurt, but you will still be treated like a special guest. Also, when checking in, ask for an opportunity for an upgrade. You can get a better room for the same price and always make sure to let the hotel know if there's any special occasion. Like a honeymoon, anniversary, birthday or anything, you'll probably end up with some nice perks from the hotel staff. Even though websites for hotel search are cool to use, once you pick the hotel, just call them directly for booking. 
Websites take fees for posting offers, so everything that appears there will be more expensive. Call the hotel directly to book a room, and you'll get it for cheaper. But don't feel limited by hotels. Airbnbs are a great option, and often you can get luxurious places for cheap. Also, if you don't mind hostels, they can be fun too. You can meet and befriend travelers from other countries, and maybe you can even stay at their place if you ever go to their country. Now off to packing. First off, always make a packing checklist and keep it on your phone. It's hard to remember everything you need right away, so put together the list in a couple of days and add another item as soon as you remember it. This way, you don't forget anything important when packing. To fit more stuff in your suitcase, roll your clothes. This way, they take way less space. Roll all the shampoos and other things that can spill over in a shower cap. This way, even if something explodes, everything inside will still be protected. Also, use packing cubes. They help to organize everything and save a lot of space. Learn to organize your stuff efficiently. A Tic Tac box can be a good storage for bobby pins, and they'll all be in place. Use a carbine to keep all hair ties together. Have you packed a pillowcase? You should. It doesn't take much space, but in case you get uncomfortable when traveling, you can just stock the pillowcase with some clothes. Voila! You got yourself a pillow. Also, put a dryer sheet inside your suitcase. This way your clothes will smell nice, even on long trips. Don't forget to make a copy of your passport and carry it in your wallet just in case. And you can also have a scanned copy of it on the cloud. Another good item to keep is a power bank. Those outlets in airports and airplanes don't always work. Also, get a crayon. It'll be handy if you need to write something down. Pens don't work well in planes because of the air pressure, and pencils break. A crayon will always be there for you. Also, a clothespin is another little thing you might want to have. You know when you arrive and want to keep your toothbrush from touching any counters? If you attach the pin to it, it can serve as a stand. Another little but useful thing is a bread clip. Those serve so many purposes. You can use it as a bookmark, attach it to the end of the tape roll, or keep in place your rolled cords in. But most importantly, they are a must for your flip-flops. The V-shaped part often comes out through it. To avoid it, just slip the bread clip underneath the bottom. It'll serve as a plug stopper, and your flip-flops will last. What to wear? Of course, comfort is the first priority. Sweatpants and leggings are way more comfortable than jeans. A comfy jacket will ensure you don't get cold. A fringe scarf is nice to have too. They're fancy and they turn into a cover. Also, make sure you're wearing compression socks. They will spare you from feeling swollen during the trip. Another important part of your outfit could be noise-canceling headphones. They will be a game changer if there happens to be a screaming little human on the plane. And an ultimate trick, mark your luggage as fragile, even if there's nothing fragile in there. This way, it'll be treated better and your luggage will come out in the first batch after the flight. Most people either sleep or surf their phones while traveling, but some travelers can even play board games. But if you need to roll a dice, here comes a problem. If you roll it not carefully enough, you might end up either losing it or crawling under the seats looking for it, which is inconvenient. Just keep the dice in a little transparent plastic container, then shake the container and see what you got. To find cool places to visit, go on social media, check out photos and videos people post from your location, and go to any place that caught your attention. Pickpockets are definitely a thing, but there is a trick. Just make your valuables less attractive to them. Do you have an expensive camera? Put some tape on it as if you fixed it, and the pickpockets will think that it's broken. Do the same with your phone and laptops and whatever else you don't want to be stolen. Have you ever ended up with a bunch of foreign coins after your trip that are totally useless? Some coins and bills are cool to keep from trips as souvenirs, but too much is too bothersome. To avoid it, just donate your leftover coins before you leave the country. A good deed and also less weight in your pockets on your way home. Are the letters SSSS on your boarding pass a reason to worry? What's much more dangerous than turbulence? Should you really be the first to board the plane? You're about to figure it out. You might have noticed that most planes have blue seats. There's no mystery here. Airlines opt for this color because it's considered to have a calming effect. This color supposedly puts passengers at ease and helps even the most nervous flyers to relax. But there's also another, more practical reason. Stains, dirt, and scrapes are less visible on dark blue fabric. Never throw your boarding pass away in a public place. 
It contains tons of your sensitive information, including your name and frequent flyer number. This, in turn, may allow someone else to check your future bookings, change your seat, or even cancel your flights. So the best way to deal with the boarding pass for a flight you've already boarded is to take it home and feed it through a paper shredder. By the way, if you ever see the letters SSSS or S on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Look, your gate is open and the boarding is started. Wait, where are you running? There's no need to hurry. The trick experienced globetrotters use is always board last. For one thing, you don't have to waste time standing in line. Then, there are fewer people on the jetway and in the aisle and you spend less time on the plane. No one is going to take your seat anyway. There's one exception though. If you have a bulky carry-on bag, it may make more sense not to board last. Otherwise, the chances are high that all the overhead bin space will be occupied by the time you reach your seat. And then your bag may end up in another part of the plane and you'll have to wait till the other passengers disembark before you get to your luggage. Duh. Before takeoff and landing, Flight attendants usually flip a small switch on the bathroom door. This prevents it from flying open when it's not supposed to. With the same ease, a flight attendant can open the door when someone is inside. Look, they only need to lift the lavatory sign and move the knob into the unlocked position. Pilots don't worry about turbulence. That's because they know that there is a thing way more dangerous than any turbulence. It's an updraft. In most cases, turbulence only drops you a couple of feet down, even though it might feel as if you're falling from the top of the Empire State Building. If the turbulence is strong enough for the pilots to ask flight attendants to sit down, the plane can go 10 to 20 feet down. The most extreme white-knuckle turbulence is super rare. But an updraft is a big air mass, part of a storm or some other weather phenomenon, moving upwards. Pilots don't see updrafts on their radars at night, and when a plane hits one, it feels like driving over a huge speed bump at 500 miles per hour. An updraft is also extremely treacherous because it can push an aircraft upward to dangerous altitudes. Modern planes have a special system that detects other aircraft, mountains, and different solid objects in their path. 10 miles away from another plane and a voice in the cockpit starts chanting traffic, traffic. Five miles closer and the same voice begins to give pilots the directions. Airplanes can operate with one engine even during takeoff and landing. Both engines failing simultaneously is almost unheard of. But even then, a plane wouldn't drop from the sky like a rock. Pilots would have up to 20 minutes to find a suitable place to land. The way the cabin is pressurized has a great effect on your taste buds. You lose up to 30% of your ability to taste sweet and salty things. In other words, it's not that airplane food isn't tasty, you just don't feel its flavor. That's also the main reason why airline catering companies add extra salt and spices to the dishes they cook. But you know what may help you? Noise cancelling earphones. For some reason, that probably has a scientific explanation. Cutting off all that noise around can help your taste buds. Each of those dings you hear during the flight has its own meaning. In most airlines, a Boeing soon after takeoff indicates that the landing gear is getting retracted. Three dings in a row means more urgency than just one. A high-low ringtone informs crew members that their colleague needs them in another part of the plane. Three low chimes means some serious turbulence ahead. Crew members are supposed to put away meal carts, take their seats, and fasten their seat belts. If you're a nervous flyer, pick a seat in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence mostly affects the front and rear parts of the cabin. The middle section, which is over the wings, doesn't shake so much. Pilots and co-pilots eat different meals. The reason for this precaution is very simple. 
Imagine both pilots having the same dish and getting food poisoning. In this case, neither of them will be able to control the plane. If they still want to have the same dish and won't agree to have anything else, there is a safety net. Pilots don't have their meals at the same time. If one pilot ate the dish and still feels okay several hours later, the other pilot can brave their meal as well. What would you say when asked about the filthiest place on a plane? Nope, that's not the toilet seat. It's not even in the bathroom. Flight attendants warn that you should be particularly careful with headrests, seat pockets, tray tables, and seat belts. Experiments have shown that one-third of all seat belts have yeast and mold on them. Most tray tables are covered with bacteria. Seat pockets are extremely filthy too, but headrests are the dirtiest of them all. In most cases, flight attendants don't have enough time to change or disinfect them in between flights. If your captain announces they're finishing some paperwork, it means they're busy revising the flight itinerary or waiting for the ground staff to prepare the flight logbook. That's a journal that contains the official record of a journey. Some places, especially those flying long distances, have secret bedrooms for crew members to catch some shut-eye. These bedrooms, called crew rest compartments, are located either at the back of the plane or behind the cockpit. Such a compartment can have up to 10 comfortable beds where flight attendants can have a rest. Plane windows are made of super strong plexiglass that can easily cope with high speeds. And the window panes are shaped in a special way so that the high pressure inside the cabin pushes them against the aircraft body. In other words, plane windows are very unlikely to get broken. Once upon a time, plane windows were square but the pressure built up in the corners of such windows, making them ultimate weak spots. This means that each square window had four weak spots. This made them likely to crash under the enormous stress of high altitudes. Luckily, making airplane windows curved solved this problem once and forever. Such a shape distributes the pressure and reduces the likelihood of cracks or any other damage. Planes regularly get struck by lightning at least once a year or once per 1,000 hours of flight time. These days, it's totally safe. The electric charge simply runs through the aircraft's aluminum shell. It doesn't cause the plane any damage. But did you know that airplanes not only get hit by lightning, but they also trigger it? When an aircraft is flying through a cloud, the friction between its fuselage and the air creates static electricity. Sometimes, it can cause lightning. Let's face it, airports can be pretty annoying, but the most annoying thing about them is probably having to take the laptop out of your backpack and put it in a separate bin while going through the security check. But of course, they wouldn't make us do those extra moves if there wasn't a good reason for it. Laptops are dense and x-rays can't penetrate them, so it's easy to hide something dangerous there. If the device is out and on its own in a separate bin, it's easier for the scanners to capture something dangerous. Most airplanes are white. Is there a benefit to choosing this exact color? No, white paint doesn't make a place feel lighter. Neither does it save money on painting. Here are the actual reasons for the choice. Safety, efficiency, and comfort. The first airplanes had a metallic color. But the problem with metal is that it's prone to corrosion, so painting it is a great way to protect an airplane from corrosion. White is favored for several reasons. First, planes fly high above the clouds and are exposed to sunlight a lot. White is the color that absorbs the least heat, and white planes get heated less. Also, sunlight makes the paint fade away. A colorful airplane will have its paint fade very fast and will require repainting. And repainting is costly, so painting aircraft white is a more lasting choice. Also, any damage is more easily noticed on a white surface. So that's one more point for the white color. We always board from the left side of the plane, every single time, no exceptions. For some reason, the right side just doesn't seem to be an option. Yes, that's done on purpose. First, the captain usually sits on the left. This way, it's easier for the pilot to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, 
aircraft are fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. Since people board the plane from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed, and there's no danger to passengers. Consistency with the choice of a side helps to make everything work more effectively. Since everyone always enters from the left, all jet bridges are designed to get attached to the left side of the airplane. If every airplane had the freedom to choose the side, it would create an additional mess for the logistics behind the process. There are more questions popping up, like what does this black triangle drawn above one of the windows mean? Apparently, it marks the seat from which the view of the airplane's wing is the best. It's needed for the crew to find the spot as fast as possible if, in case of an emergency, they need to inspect the engines, slats, or flaps. This mark saves a lot of time. Next, the rows aren't well aligned with the windows. This is business. Originally, all planes are designed with rows and windows lining up perfectly. But when an airline buys a jet, they add some additional seats, squeezing them closer together. This way, they have more seats, which means more passengers, so they can sell more tickets. But you get less space for your legs and might miss out on a window. Also, all windows have rounded corners, and this is done for safety reasons. There used to be planes with squared windows, but those caused crashes because such windows couldn't withstand high altitude pressures. At high altitudes, external atmospheric pressure is lower than the pressure inside the cabin. So, there's a big difference in pressure inside and outside the airplane, and this creates stress. Without windows, this stress flows smoothly through the material. A squared window becomes an obstacle, and the flow of stress needs to change direction. The pressure builds up in the corners, leading to cracks. As a result, such windows break. Oval windows allow the stress to flow more smoothly, without disrupting them too much and preventing stress concentration. So, oval windows are safer. The glass used in production is stretched acrylic glass, and there are three separate panes of it. This is done as a security measure in case there is a breach. This way, at least one pane will remain intact at all times. Have you ever noticed those small holes in the windows? The tiny hole is actually only in the pane that's in the middle. Its task is to regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin. This way, the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane breaks, the middle one, even though there's a hole in it, will be able to keep the window intact. Also, that hole prevents the windows from fogging up. Now, let's say you want to relax and watch a movie. Luckily, there's a pair of headphones, but they're weird. They have a two-pronged plug. No, this is not some kind of advanced technology. This is a witty move to prevent theft. If you can't use them anywhere else but on the airplane, no one will have the urge to snatch them away. Outside the airplane, they're basically useless. And then they bring food. There are people who love airplane food and people who aren't very fond of it. But most will agree that food does taste different in the air. Turns out it's actually a thing. Low air pressure, lack of humidity, and background noise that we have at high altitudes change the functioning of our taste buds. They become less sensitive to sweet and salty foods, so airlines have to use more seasoning. Have you ever wondered what would happen if someone opened an airplane door accidentally? This wouldn't end well. It would be very dangerous to say the least. More specifically, soon there would be a lack of oxygen in the cabin. But gladly, no one can open that door accidentally. The pressure difference between inside and outside makes it almost impossible. It would take some immense strength to open it. The doors are designed to open on their own in case of an emergency. Speaking of safety, during takeoff and landing, the crew dims the light in the cabin. This is done for a good reason. This way, in case of emergency, you will see everything more clearly. Your eyes will get used to the darkness, and you'll have an easier time evacuating. Now, about pilots. They always wear those cool sunglasses, but the purpose is not to look cooler. They're used to protect the eyes. Throughout their career, pilots have to take care of their vision, but the problem is that it's not an easy task when you're a pilot. 
The damaging solar radiation that our sun emits is filtered out by the Earth's atmosphere, so the sunlight isn't very damaging to you if you spend most of your time on the ground. But it's different up in the sky. There's less air there, and the brightness is way higher. And with every 1,000 feet of elevation, the solar radiation is around 5% stronger. On average, aircraft fly at an altitude of 35,000 feet. This means that the amount of UV radiation is 175% greater than on the ground. This is very damaging to any person's vision. The large amount of time pilots spend in the air makes them vulnerable to different eye problems. And having eye problems can cost a pilot their career. So, wearing sunglasses is a crucial thing for them, and these sunglasses must be of the best quality. They should minimize the impact of sunlight and withstand UV rays, providing 100% protection for the eyes. Also, they can't be polarized, since polarization can mess with the perception of the cockpit displays. They should provide the best clarity, decrease eye fatigue, and minimize color deformation, so that pilots can see just like they would without their sunglasses on. Welcome aboard our flight from London to Miami. It will take us four hours and 30 minutes. The weather in Miami is, wait, did the pilot just say four hours and a half? It sounds like a dream, but it will most likely become our reality in less than 10 years from now. Boom Supersonic, an aircraft manufacturer, is working on a passenger supersonic jet called the Overture that will be able to carry 65 to 80 people at twice the speed of current commercial aircraft. One of the major American airlines is interested in buying around 40 planes. The plane that's going to cost $200 million has recently passed the wind tunnel tests. If all goes well, the first finished Overture prototype will roll off the line in 2025 and will travel at nearly twice the speed of sound. The plane will be able to show its top speed over the sea, so it should be ideal for transatlantic flights. And then, Traveling from, say, New York to Paris should take no longer than four hours. But first, it will have to get all the official permissions to do it. Some people are skeptical about the whole passenger superjet concept as they remember the story of the Concorde. That high-end plane delivered people from London to New York in about three hours and serviced other transatlantic connections. The tickets cost a whopping $10,000 per seat and passengers got access to a super-exclusive lounge with lobster and Angus beef for lunch. The Concorde went on its final commercial flight in 2003. It was a huge fuel guzzler. Plus, there are many complaints from people living near airports about the noise it produced. The Overture is supposed to be more fuel efficient, lighter, and have better software to make it more aerodynamic. The noise might still be a problem, though, because supersonic aircraft need aerodynamic engines, which are pretty loud. That will definitely change in the future, as planes have gone a long way since their first flight in 1903. Back then, the Wright brothers started the aerial age with a 12-second flight traveling 120 feet in North Carolina. The top speed at that time was around 30 miles per hour, but it still seemed pretty impressive. The world's first passenger airline service took off just 11 years later. The flight from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida lasted 23 minutes. Covering the distance by car around the bay took about 20 hours, so that was a great time saver. The tickets cost $5 and were sold out 16 weeks in advance, but the airline went out of business in four months. The new age in aviation began in the 1950s when they introduced the turbofan engine. It became possible as they started using temperature-resistant materials and complex air cooling systems. Planes also became lighter as they were made of composite materials. The wings have also improved over the years. The airfoil, that's the part thanks to which the air travels faster above the wing than below it, became a real game-changer. Thanks to it, the planes keep a low speed during takeoff, which means they move smoothly and burn less fuel. The fastest plane in the world so far is North American X-15. It was rocket-powered and made of aluminum and titanium. A huge wedge tail helped it stay stable at that super speed. 
the rocket plane set the world's altitude record, reaching an altitude of 67 miles. Oh, and to make it even more impressive, it happened back in 1967. So, if it was possible back then already, why don't we all just fly rocket planes, or at least supersonics, especially on long-distance flights? In terms of speed, passenger planes are still where they were 50 years ago, mostly because speeding flights up would also make them way more expensive. Flying faster means burning more fuel. Plus, supersonic engines are expensive to produce and maintain. Another reason is natural forces. The winds affect the speed of a plane, and no technology can control the wind. A strong tailwind can help it move forward at a higher speed, and a headwind can slow the aircraft down. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. Up there, the air is thinner, which means there's less resistance, and a plane can fly faster and save some fuel. Also, the lower temperatures make the jet engines more efficient. Another perk of flying through that part of the atmosphere is that it's less turbulent, so flights go smoother. Private jets can't fly that high. They're smaller, and their engines aren't strong enough to reach such an altitude, so they stick around to 15,000 feet. Ever notice those white trails that planes leave behind? Their official name is contrails, and they're like artificial clouds planes leave behind. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude, temperatures get quite low, about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water turns into particles of ice. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get, and you can see them long after the plane has disappeared. So, thick and long contrails can be a sign of an upcoming storm. Sometimes contrails can even be colorful. The droplets of water that are formed up in the atmosphere can freeze in different sizes. They all reflect sunlight at different wavelengths, causing the effect of a rainbow. When all the colors mix, it appears white, the most common contrail color. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. It's kind of like a kite. To make it fly, you launch it against the wind, and there it goes. That's because there are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lift is generated because the speed of the air is higher above the kite than below it. The kite is pushed upwards. This is the lifting force. Going through a storm is one pretty scary experience, but is it really as dangerous as it seems? In fact, the most critical moments in windy weather are takeoff and landing. Plane manufacturers test their aircraft and specify speed limits at which the pilots should move in different weather conditions. At some airports, the winds are pretty severe all year round, so landing can get pretty wobbly. It requires a real pro of a pilot to land when the wind strikes the runway. Sometimes, the wind unexpectedly changes its speed and direction. The pilot really has to know what they're doing to land when the wind direction changes. Otherwise, the risk of overshooting the runway is pretty real. Extreme heat is another weather condition that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, an airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of a secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food and drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones means serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? You have nothing to worry about. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and it switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. 
the Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there's one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Khumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. There's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, 
it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the U.S. President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. Airports are some of the most visited and, at the same time, mysterious places out there. So, let's see what's going on behind the scenes and what secrets airports hide. At some airports, there are special people called profilers. Such people bring to life a special program called SPOT, Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They analyze your mimics, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice nonverbal signs of anxiety, people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in an unusual way, they can invite them for an inspection. There, they talk to this person, trying to find out more about them and confirm, or not, their suspicions. Airport agents might also be watching you all the way from the security check to your gate. Some airports have facial recognition scanners that can easily track you. They're equipped with special software that compares passengers' faces with their IDs. Keep in mind that if you don't charge your laptop before the flight, it may be confiscated. It's not uncommon for an airport security officer to ask you to power your device up. 
If you fail to do it, your gadget can be taken away for an additional check. For safety reasons, it's crucial to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with or modified in a way that can cause harm during the flight. Packing an electric brush in your check-in luggage may land you in trouble. Brushes produced by some brands have lithium batteries inside, and those can potentially lead to serious problems in the air. That's why leaving your electric brush in your check suitcase isn't an option. But you're allowed to store them in your carry-on bag. At the same time, if your device runs on AA batteries, you can put it wherever you want. Anyone who's ever traveled by plane knows about the no liquids rule, but not everybody knows that this rule also applies to peanut butter, toothpaste, creams, lotions, liquid makeup, lava lamps, snow globes, some kinds of medications, deodorant, and even gel shoe inserts. Now, let's go outside for a while and look at those landing spots. Airports charge airline companies huge fees for landing on their runways on certain days and at particular times. But the most interesting thing is that the landing spots can be bought and sold. For example, in 2016, Oman Air paid Air France around $75 million for one early morning arrival slot at London Heathrow Airport. You must have noticed that airfare has increased over the past decade. That's because of the extremely high prices of landing slots. Dispatchers don't only control the planes in the sky, as you can often see in the movies, but they also look after their movements on the ground. They also control the lighting on the runways. There's three types of air traffic controllers, en route, terminal, and tower. Each of these dispatchers has their own area of responsibility. One dispatcher has about five monitors, and the information on them is constantly changing since the monitors show weather conditions and information about other planes. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to a security checkpoint, and all of a sudden, it turns out you have something prohibited in your carry-on. But worry not, you still have a chance to save your favorite pen knife. At some airports, there are on-site postal services, and you might have an opportunity to mail your belongings to any address you provide. But the mailing fees are pretty high. Plus, certain items are prohibited, and the postal service won't deliver them. Airports can be selling your lost luggage right now. Of course, I don't say that there's no chance for you to get back your suitcases that's traveled to a different destination, but just as likely, you might not see it again. In this case, an airport has the right to sell your misplaced belongings at an auction. Most airports have an annual lost luggage sale. After paying an entry fee, you can bid on electronics, clothes, bags, and other stuff. While flying, you might have a celebrity on board, but you won't know it. Large airports have separate check-in and security procedures for celebrities. They often board the plane directly through a hidden door located beside the jet bridge. Some airlines also use cool cars to transfer VIP passengers from the terminal building to the plane. At the same time, most people come to the airport well ahead of time. And the most popular activity while waiting for a flight is wandering through the duty-free zone. And even though people rarely plan to buy anything there, different products end up in their shopping baskets. That's because lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes people feel relaxed and at ease. I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light, massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, Calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. Designers put a lot of thought into airport layouts. It helps to ensure the smooth flow of travelers. And the main point here is easy navigation that can prevent people from getting lost. This is achieved through subtle but very effective design cues. And placing duty-free zones between security checkpoints and boarding gates is one of them. They supposedly help you relax after clearing security and lead you where you need to go. But speaking of food, a celebrity chef restaurant at the airport might not be as good as it would be if you were visiting the real thing. Not chefs themselves, but special restaurant companies are responsible for airport outlets. One of the reasons is the extremely strict security that surrounds airport deliveries, including food. 
You may still have a nice meal, but it won't be the same. Now, I'll tell you about one more way airports manipulate you into spending your money. They make you walk through the shiny duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look to the right while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are more likely to look. Oh, and have you ever noticed how many mirrors there are at airports? Mirrors are strategically placed there to make airports appear larger and create an illusion of more space. This in turn helps to reduce the feeling of claustrophobia and makes the airport experience more comfortable for travelers. If you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who didn't buy local currency in advance can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours notice for such an order, or it might even be better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, have you ever paid attention to airport codes? The most often used are three letter codes. Why this number? Back in the 1930s in the USA, pilots used the National Weather Service's two letter city codes to refer to airports. But soon, the number of airports in the country outgrew the number of such codes. That's why airlines expanded this system by adding the third letter. It was usually X. That's how LA, Los Angeles, turned into LAX. But even though there shouldn't be two airports with the same code, some of these codes sound so similar you could easily mistake one for the other. For example, look at this airport with the code CGP in Bangladesh. And here we have CPG. It's the code of an airport in Argentina. It's dangerously easy to fly to the wrong place. So pay attention. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared for different airlines at once. Since those oh so delightful airplane meals must be cooked about six to 10 hours prior to the flight, the kitchens have to work 24 seven. Besides, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, American Airlines managed to save $40,000 per year in 1987 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option there's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you check in, the golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Sitting in a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting. If you ever wanted to know what happens to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't know once it leaves their territory. And they probably don't really care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your baggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your baggage to the wrong country. You arrive at the airport, already anticipating a couple weeks away from work and all your daily troubles. Park your car in the lot and then find out that it's going to cost you a small fortune to leave your car there. 
Why so much? In fact, airport parking lots are a business just like any other. The land on which they're built, the construction of the lot itself, the maintenance of the whole thing once it's already in operation, all that costs a handsome amount of money. And somebody's got to pay for it, of course. In addition, parking right next to an airport is simply convenient, which adds to the final cost. If you're not ready to dip into your pocket for a piece of extra comfort, better take a cab. Contrails Those white trails airplanes often leave behind them at high altitudes are easily mistaken for engine exhaust. But most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. If it's already humid up there, then there's more water and the contrail is more prominent. And if it's cold, the droplets might turn into ice, staying behind for a much longer time. If someone were able to open the door mid-flight, they would be immediately pulled out of the plane by a sudden change in air pressure. It could also do serious harm to the aircraft. Fortunately, that's almost impossible. The doors on an airliner open inward while the cabin pressure pushes them out from the inside. The difference between internal and external pressure makes it impossible for the door to open. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down. The main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Another reason for all the shades to stay up when the airplane is about to take off or land is for the ground crew to see if there's any trouble on board. For example, if there's a fire in the cabin, the ground crew will immediately notice it and act accordingly. If the shades are down, they might lose precious time they would need to rescue the passengers and the airplane crew. Ever notice the numbers on the end of the runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees, or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. Every commercial airplane you've been on has only one wing. That's right, the left and right wings are actually two parts of a single wing. The first airplanes were called biplanes because they had two wings one on the top and the other going through the bottom of the fuselage. They were connected with struts and wires, which made a kind of box that basically allowed the aircraft not to fall apart in the air. It was necessary at lower speeds that early planes could only muster. But as the engines increased in power, the second wing became redundant. The single wing still serves as a support for the whole structure though. Looking out the window on the plane's wing you can see a small yellow double hook on it. It seems strange since it might mess with aerodynamics, but it's there for your safety. In case of an emergency landing, these hooks are used to secure ropes that help passengers exit the plane via the wings. If they're slippery, the rope will help you keep your footing and not fall over while going down. There are several extremely fast streams of air high up in the atmosphere of our planet. Their paths are meandering, but they have a more or less constant flow, allowing passenger aircraft to use them. When an airplane comes close to a jet stream, it may adjust to the direction of its current and fly a lot faster, propelled by the flow. Many airlines use this to their advantage to cut the fuel costs and make air traveling even faster. Clouds, especially thunderheads, can indicate that an area of turbulence is ahead. But sometimes, clear air turbulence occurs when a plane can drop a few feet and start shaking without any warning. It happens when two bodies of air clash at very high speeds. And it's absolutely invisible, so the pilots can't tell when it would happen. The chances of getting into an area of clear air turbulence are higher at low altitudes, over mountain ranges, and near the jet streams. Normally, after it's hit by lightning, an airplane is sent for inspection right after landing, 
but it can still safely complete its current flight. The fuselage conducts electricity well enough, and like with a lightning rod, the zap will most probably strike one of the tips of the airplane, either one of the wings or the nose. Then it seeks the ground, but doesn't find it, exiting from the tail in the end. It's easier for electricity to roll through the surface of the plane than go inside, so people on board are safe from its effects. Still, lightning is powerful, and there can be some damage done to the airplane on the outside. Many airports have carpets at their gate areas. This nicety usually comes with a few other perks. Lower ceilings, comfortable seats, and pleasant natural lighting. All this costs more for airports, and carpets are not so easy to clean as hard floors are. But they create a cozy feeling for passengers waiting for their flight, making them more relaxed. Still, it isn't a gesture of goodwill on the part of airports. According to social research, calm passengers are about 7-10% to more likely to go window shopping and actually buy something in the lounge area or duty-free zone. So, by investing in the passenger's comfort, airports actually increase their own income. If you ever wanted to know what happened to your baggage while you're on board a plane, the short answer is that airport staff don't actually know once it leaves their territory, and they probably really don't care. Sorry. Baggage is sorted automatically. Scanners scan the barcode and sort the baggage according to its destination. The three main tasks of airport baggage handlers are to move your bags from the check-in area to the gate, to move them from one gate to another when you have a connection, and to move your bags from the plane to the baggage claim area. And that's it. So if your luggage doesn't move fast enough, it can be late for your connecting flight, or the exact opposite. Your bag gets to your destination before you do because you're stuck at passport control. Another problem can arise if you forget to tear off any old stickers showing a different destination. In this case, the scanner might send your luggage to the wrong country. Most airports are equipped with giant kitchens where the food for passengers is prepared. These kitchens usually cook food for different airlines at once. And since that oh-so-delightful airplane food must be cooked for about 6 to 10 hours in advance, these kitchens have to work 24-7. And however surprising it might sound, the menu for your flight is developed up to a year in advance. This is a common practice for most airlines because every single ingredient matters and adds to expenses. In fact, one airline managed to save $40,000 after they removed just one olive from every salad they served on their flights. Airport staff sometimes ask passengers to rub their hands on a piece of cloth before putting it into a special machine. It might seem kind of scary, but it's actually harmless. You're simply being checked by a machine called an atomizer. Before their working day starts, employees put samples of dangerous chemicals into the machine. The machine memorizes these smells, and in case a person's hand smells like those chemicals, it alerts airport staff to this danger. You know how it sometimes goes. You come to the security checkpoint, and suddenly, it turns out you have something prohibited to take on board in your carry-on. But don't worry, all the things seized during the pre-flight inspection can be stored at the airport for as long as three months. On top of that, you have an opportunity to mail them any address inside the country. Things taken away by security and weren't claimed can also get sold at special auctions and are delivered worldwide. If you have a long layover between flights, going to the nearest hotel to rest might not be the cheapest option. There's a much better trick. Check if the airport or airline sells 24-hour access to the VIP lounge zone. In most cases, you can have free snacks and drinks there and use free shower cabins and rooms for rest at a very affordable price. In multi-terminal airports, search for underground passageways connecting terminals that most people might not know about. For example, at Frankfurt Airport in Germany, there's a walking tunnel between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 that's mostly used by employees since passengers are simply unaware of its existence. There's an actual term for the first 60 minutes after you clear check-in. The golden hour. It's the time that passengers statistically spend more money in retail and duty-free areas of the airport. And having the most comfortable seats in those areas right in front of the shops is a clever trick to lure you in for shopping. Let's admit, Sitting in front of a comfy chair while looking at a flashy sign or shopping window can be tempting, and that's exactly what the airports want you to feel. If your flight is overbooked and you can't fly at the designated time, don't hurry to accept the first voucher you're offered as an apology. 
Normally, airlines keep raising the stakes until they have enough volunteers to give up their flight seats. And if they don't, and you've been bumped in voluntarily, you can insist on a cash refund instead. Depending on your ticket price and the time of your delay, you might be entitled to as much as $1,300. Most airports have specific experts called profilers. These people practice what's called SPOT, or the Screening Passengers by Observation Technique. They carefully analyze facial expressions, gestures, and behavior in order to detect suspicious people. Their job is to notice the nonverbal signs of anxiety, such as people licking their lips, itching, or looking around a lot. If a profiler notices a person acting in a weird or off way, they can invite them for an inspection, where they can talk to a person to find out more about them. Profilers work in both the main halls and in passport control. The typical question they ask is, what's the purpose of your visit? Then they check the person's reaction to this inquiry. No matter how reserved a passenger is, if they have something to hide, TSA officers will find out, thanks to the tiniest cues in people's behavior. Before your luggage even gets on the plane, it goes through five security levels, and one of them, besides scanning the contents, includes being checked by a special dog that can sniff out dangerous chemicals. It's a well-known fact that a dog's nose is much stronger than that of any human. In fact, dogs distinguish smells from 10,000 to 100,000 times better than people do. No wonder airports take advantage of this super sense for security and regularly use these sniffer dogs to detect suspicious substances. What's really cool is that you can't even distinguish a detection dog from its civilian siblings. Unlike police dogs, the ones working at airports aren't trained to frighten or intimidate people. The most popular sniffer breeds are Golden Retrievers, Labs, and German Short-Haired Pointers. Charging your phone at a specifically designated spot can look convenient, but it's not really safe. If the charging station only allows you to plug in your cord, you might get malware installed on your phone with you none the wiser. The only safe way to charge your phone or tablet is to find an electric socket and use it with your own charger. Same goes for free airport Wi-Fi. Apart from the airports requiring you to authenticate yourself more often than not, someone can easily access your data while you're using an unprotected Wi-Fi hotspot. It's safer to use your mobile data, but if you absolutely have to use the airport's Wi-Fi, best clear or encrypt all your important data on your device. It might be exasperating to take your laptop out of your carry-on at the security check every single time. But the airport staff need to have a clear look at your device to make sure nothing is concealed inside. On the screen of an x-ray scanner, a laptop looks like a semi-transparent object with a clearly visible hard drive, CD drive, and whatnot. But security officers can't see what's behind some of those parts. For example, a dense and rather large battery. People tend to choose the closest security line to them. If that line turns out to be super crowded, just look around after ID and ticket check. You may see another checkpoint with much fewer people. Some checkpoints at the airport are situated at the far edges of the terminal, and that's why passengers fail to notice them. Applying for a TSA pre-check can be a great time saver for traveling in and out of the US. Being a member of this program has some great perks. First, getting through security and passport control happens faster. If you're a pre-check traveler, you won't have to take off your shoes or remove your belt. And forget about placing your stuff like liquids and laptops in special bins. If you aren't flying to or from the US, then you can look up similar services available in your country. If you're flying economy class but don't like it, who does? Check in online and check out the seating options about four days before your flight. It's about that time that airlines typically start upgrading seats, and you might get an upgrade to business class for a small fee or even sometimes for free. You can also ask for an upgrade when you're already at the airport. Most people forget about this opportunity or simply don't care, so you might just get lucky. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you